A building is located at 33 degrees north latitude. At its location, the daily temperature swing is 24 degrees at 4 p.m. in mid-July, suntime. The inside design temperature is 78 degrees, the outside design temperature is 96 degrees, and the building is constructed as follows. And then we have the area for the walls, north, south, east, and west, and we know the materials used for the building construction for the walls, and we can find out their R values or K values and work out the overall resistance. And then we have the same for the roof. We know the area and the building materials. And we know that there's a certain area of windows and what type of window. We have some information about blinds. For the purpose of this problem, ignore heat transmission through studs, joists, and the floor. Ignore heat gain from lights and occupants. And the question is, A, what is the instantaneous heat gain at 4 p.m. in mid-July? And B, why or why not is this the peak cooling load? Okay, so let's talk through the plan of attack. The first thing we're gonna do is look up the cooling load temperature difference values. Or in our case, we may just take them as a given because usually on actual test problems, they wouldn't expect you to have to look this up in the ASHRAE fundamentals, although it is possible. The example problems that I've seen haven't required that. So I'm gonna take them as given. And then next, we'll look at the walls and we'll take into consideration these different materials and their thicknesses and their resistance values and figure out what the overall heat transfer coefficient is for the walls. And that's variable U for the overall heat transfer coefficient. Let's call this 2A since it deals with the walls and then we'll call this 2B. We can find the total heat transfer through the walls and that'll be Q dot for the walls. And then in the same fashion, we can find the overall heat transfer coefficient for the roof and the total heat transfer for the roof. So I'll call that 3A and 3B. So U for the roof and Q dot for the roof. And then we'll do something similar for the windows. We'll find the heat transfer coefficient and the total heat transfer through the windows. Now for these, I'm going to give a partial explanation. I just wanted to be upfront about that. I have some questions about how these two numbers are being arrived at so I'll share what I can and if folks want to chime in with some comments and help fill in the blanks that would be fantastic. I still think there's a lot to be gained from doing this problem so if there are a few things that are a little confusing take what you can. There's still a lot of value in going through the exercise of finding the overall heat transfer coefficient, finding the total heat transfer and, and thinking about the aspects of the problems that we do know. Okay so once we have the heat transfer for the walls, roof, and windows, we'll add them all up. That will give us the total heat transfer. So we'll say find Q dot total, and that answers part A. And lastly, we'll give some thought to part B, their question about why or why isn't this the peak cooling load. Okay, so let's start with a little background in case you have to read up in the merm a bit as I did in starting to think about this problem. Start with section 43.3, where they talk about instantaneous cooling load from walls and roofs. And the basic governing equation that they give there is equation 43.5, where they say that the total heat transfer, Q dot, is equal to the overall heat transfer coefficient times the area times delta T, and they use the subscript TE, which means the total equivalent temperature difference. And I'll just read a paragraph from the Merm that kind of explains the lead up to this equation. It says, the total equivalent temperature difference method determines the instantaneous heat gain. The total equivalent temperature difference, delta T sub TE, depends on the type of construction, geographical location, time of day, and wall orientation. It is read from extensive tabulations. The instantaneous heat gain consists of stored radiant and convective portions. In the total equivalent temperature difference time averaging method, weighting factors are used to average the radiant portions from current and previous hours. The sum of the convective portions and the weighted average of the series of radiant portions are taken as the cooling load. Computer analysis and considerable judgment are required to use this method. So what I really get out of that is the convective and the radiant components are accounted for within this method. So they're taking into consideration the fact that there's some delta T with the outside air temperature, but they're also taking into consideration the fact that there's sun, which means we should expect to see more heat transfer on the south side than the north. 
and somewhere in between those two numbers for the east and the west over the course of the day. But of course, it's going to vary from hour to hour. And we'll see a greater effective delta T for the roof than for any of the walls because it's subject to solar load all the time or all the time that it's sunny anyway. But the problem is that this is read from extensive tables and it requires computer methods. So for a hand calculation, they've simplified this into the more common, and this is something that we've done in previous problems already, which is the cooling load temperature difference. So if you read on after that section to some of the upcoming equations, you'll see equation 43.6, which gets rid of the delta T, TE, and replaces the total equivalent temperature difference with the cooling load temperature difference. And they have a subscript of corrected, so we'll talk about what that means. In the very next equation, 43.7, it defines the cooling load temperature difference corrected as being adapted from the cooling load temperature difference read from a table plus 78 degrees Fahrenheit minus the indoor temperature plus the mean temperature minus 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Now in our case, they've told us that the inside design temperature is 78. So if we plug 78 in here, then this term goes to zero. And then the mean temperature also has to get calculated, and that's why they gave us the range. The next equation is 43.8, and they define the mean temperature, this shouldn't be surprising, as the maximum outdoor temperature minus half of the daily range. So in this case, the outdoor design temperature is 96 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're subtracting half of the daily range, which was 24. So we're subtracting 12, we get 84 degrees Fahrenheit is the mean temperature. And if we plug that in here, this becomes 84 minus 85, which is minus one. So the correction would be to take the value you get from the table and subtract one. Now the accuracy of the table, it includes a lot of assumptions. So for the sake of simplicity in this problem, I'm not actually going to do the lookup, so I won't make that, I won't show that correction is happening. I'm going to take the, the cooling load temperature difference values from the answer solution and just apply them. But I did want to talk through this so that if you ever are in a position where you have to look it up in the table, or maybe they've given you the values in the table and you have to include the corrections, you're aware that this goes on in the background. And for all intents and purposes, I can't imagine the values are that different. You know, if it's a 20 degree delta T and you change it by one, that's a 5% difference on your answer. And we only really expect the solution to be maybe plus or minus 20% accurate. So, but of course you don't want to introduce unnecessary error. So not to belabor the point, if you did have to do the, the lookup, you would be using the ASHRAE fundamentals handbook. But in our case, we're just going to take them as given. So these are right from the answer solution. And for the walls, we have 17 degree delta T for the north. 28 degree delta T for the south, and 20 each for the east and the west. And then for the roof, we have 74. Very big number for the roof. And of course, these are all delta Ts, so they have units of degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so with that out of the way, we're ready to start looking at the walls and work out what the overall heat transfer coefficient is, and then ultimately find the total heat transfer through the walls. So the equation we'll use is 42.3 which says that the overall heat transfer coefficient is one over the sum of the individual resistances for each of the building materials. So we'll call that summation R sub I. And those resistances come in a few different flavors and we're gonna add them all up. So what does that look like? It might look like a film coefficient. So there's an inside film coefficient for the air inside the building, which isn't moving. So we'll call that H sub I. And then there's another film coefficient usually greater for the outside. And we'll have to make some assumptions as to whether that air is moving. So we'll call that H sub O. And then we might be given a thermal conductivity value K, which is different from a thermal resistance value. It's, it's, it's reciprocal. It actually has the same units as a heat transfer coefficient. So in that case, we wanna do one over K, but K can be in terms of per unit length. So we'll have to multiply by the thickness of whatever material. So that ends up becoming an L over K term. And we'll have examples of each of these. And then the last possibility is that we're literally just given a resistance. 
So in that case, we'll just add it directly. And we may have to do this for as many times, for as many materials as there are. And because there's different formulations here, it's almost not worth getting hung up on what variable. And the thing to really pay attention to here is the units. If you watch the units of the things you're getting, you can make sure it works out. So let's make a quick table for all of the materials that comprise the walls and write down as much thermal resistance information as we can for each of them. So we have the inside film coefficient and the outside film coefficient. We have the four inch brick, we have the four inch clay, and we have three and a half inch fiberglass insulation, and we have five eighths inch drywall. So for the air, there's a table 42.2, which is the film coefficients for air. And for inside, we can assume the air is not moving, so zero miles an hour. And this is 1.46, and it has units of BTU per hour, foot squared, degrees F. And I'm gonna write the units for each and every one of these. I know it's tedious, but it's gonna help us understand which one of these formulations to use when we plug it in. For the outside film coefficient, it's hard to know what to assume in terms of the wind. I guess if you have some wind data about the particular location we're dealing with. In our case, it's a sunny July day at 33 north latitude, so we don't have a ton of information. I'm gonna pick the one in the middle and assume it's seven and a half miles an hour. So we'll get four, and the units are the same, BTU per hour foot squared degrees Fahrenheit. And both of these came from table 42.2. And then for the brick, it actually does list four inch brick. So they could give you the thermal resistance for one inch and then you could multiply it by four, but they actually give it to us for four inch brick because I guess that's pretty typical. And it's 0.44. And now notice this is a resistance, not a conductivity or a heat transfer coefficient. So it's the reciprocal units, hour foot squared degrees F over BTU. And that's the same for the next one, the clay. Four inch clay is 1.11. And then for the insulation, they give it to us on a per inch basis. So we're gonna have to include the thickness, the three and a half when we make the substitution. That is 3.85 and the units are hour, foot squared, degree F over BTU and inch, it's per inch. That's not really one of the examples shown up here, but it's going to be like L times R for this guy. And that's why I don't get too hung up on, on these. I just look at the units. And finally, for the drywall, that's 0.56, and that's a total resistance. All of these values were looked up in the appendix in app 42A, which is the insulating properties of different building materials. Okay, so once we get all those values, we want to plug them in like this to find U for the walls, overall heat transfer coefficient. That's gonna be one over a bunch of things. So first we have those heat transfer coefficients. So it's gonna be one over H sub I and one over H sub O. So 1.46 plus for the inside and one over four for the outside. Now I can't write the units here. It's just too cumbersome to do that, but let's at least discuss them. One over this, is going to take its reciprocal so it's going to go from being a heat transfer coefficient or a conductivity to a resistance in the denominator so the denominator is summing up resistances and then we're ultimately taking the reciprocal at the end so it ends up being a heat transfer coefficient so as long as we're summing up resistances in the denominator we're okay so all of the denominator terms should ultimately be looking like this hour foot squared degrees f over btu so we're making sure of that. So next we'll do the brick. So that's just a straight resistance. So plus 0.44. And the clay in the same manner is plus 1.11. And then we had the fiberglass, which is 3.85. And that's per inch. It's resistance per inch. So we're going to multiply that by three and a half inches of it. And then lastly, we have the drywall plus 0.56. So if we add all of those resistances up in the denominator, and then take the reciprocal at the end, we get an overall heat transfer coefficient for the walls of 0 0.061, and that has units of BTU per hour, foot squared, degrees F. Now we can find the total heat transfer through the walls using UA delta T, so that's the U value right there, that 0 0.061. 
and now the area is different for every wall and the delta t that we're going to use is not the actual delta t between inside and outside it's the cltd cooling load temperature difference that we assumed in the previous step and if we want to do this all in one shot it's going to be the same overall heat transfer coefficient but different areas and different delta t's so we can do some grouping here for the north we have 1700 square feet and a delta t of 17 for the south we have 1500 square feet and a delta t of 28 and then for the east and west it's 1600 square feet 20 degree delta t and 1500 square feet again with a 20 degree delta t so adding all that up the total heat transfer coefficient for the walls is 8,107 and since feet and degrees F cancel out this is in BTUs per hour which is appropriate for total heat transfer. Okay so now we'll go through a very similar process for the roof. There's a lot of different materials on the roof. Let's make our list. We have an inside and outside film coefficient. We have four inch concrete. They tell us there's a two inch elastomer, four ply asphalt paper, half inch plywood, eight and a half inch fiberglass insulation, five eighths inch drywall, and half inch acoustical ceiling tile. So I'll take the same values for the inside and outside film coefficient as before. That's 1.63 and four. And just as a reminder, those are coming from table 42.4. And the concrete is given to us on a resistance per inch basis. It says it's 0.11 hour foot squared F over BTU inch. So I'll just make a note over here that this is per inch. So we don't forget when we plug it in. The two inch elastomer, they've given us a K value for it. They're saying K equals 0.28 and that has units of BTU inch over our foot squared degree F. So for that one, we'll have to do L over K. The asphalt paper is not anywhere in app 42A. These are coming from app 42A. So it's hard to know what the resistance value is. I guess there's a couple ways to look at it. One is, is it really there for its insulating properties or is it there for something else? If you don't think it's going to have a significant contribution to the overall insulating properties of the roof, you can just neglect it or you can make an assumption. The assumption that the solution uses is that it equates to some amount of uh, building board or some other substitute material and then they throw a number at it. You could just as easily neglect it. There's so much insulation here and that's really the thing that's driving the overall insulating properties of the roof. We'll, we'll show this when we run the numbers. Um, so how important is this really? But just for the sake of consistency with the overall solution, I'll use the value that they used, which was 0.33 hour foot squared F over BTU. And we can just note here that this is an assumption. The half inch plywood gets 0.63. And the fiberglass insulation is the same as before. It's 3.85, and that's resistance per inch. So we'll have to multiply by the number of inches. And the drywall is 0.56, and the acoustical tile is 